Hi, welcome to Talking Books and Stuff, the program that talks all about books and writing and stuff. Here's your host, Dennis Rimmer. Hello, welcome back. It's Talking Books and Writing and Stuff, the podcast that talks all about books and writing and stuff at, uh, as you know, www.talkingbooks.tk. Today with us we have Molly Laser from Pennsylvania, somewhere in Pennsylvania, near Philadelphia, I think. And the book we're talking about right now, there's a couple of them. It's Owl Eyes, which is a fairy tale. And there's also Lentils in Black Rice. So, but before we get that, uh, Molly Laser, thank you very much for being with us today. Thank you so much for having me. I'm very excited to be here. Oh, good. <laughs> and uh, before we get into the, the body of the work, so to speak, uh, tell us a little bit about your background. Um, where were you born and raised? That kind of stuff. Sure. So I grew up in Connecticut, uh, where I, uh, you know, uh, grew up with my parents and my sister, and I went to school. Um, I always wrote growing up since I was very young. Um, I went to, I moved to Pennsylvania for college, where I went to the University of Pennsylvania and uh, majored in English with a concentration in creative writing, and uh, also majored in theater arts, where I uh, did a whole lot of acting, but my my primary focus course wise was on technical theater and directing. Um, so I had applied to a slew of MFA programs uh, at, at, during my senior year of college because I decided I wanted to um, just write for the next two years. And I got rejected from every single one of the MFA programs <laughs> um, for sort of good reason. I understand in retrospect why they rejected me, though at the time it was deeply upsetting. Um, and I had to decide, all right, well, now that I'm not going to grad school, what am I going to do with my life? And I had recently gotten back into comic books, uh, which I was a huge fan of when I was uh, very young. And I had started reading them again when I was a sophomore in college. And so I decided that if I could do anything with my life, I would want to be an editor in the comic book industry, which I thought was kind of a pipe dream. But then it turned out that I actually had connections I didn't know about in the comic book industry. And lo and behold, within about two months of graduating from college, I was actually working at Marvel Comics as an editor. Now, um, wow. Yes. Carry, yeah. <laughs> carry, wow. Carry on. <laughs> <laughs> so I so I spent four years at Marvel working under Tom Brevoort uh, in the Marvel Heroes office where we did books like Avengers and Captain America, Iron Man, Fantastic Four. Um, and Fantastic Four is like my all time favorite uh, comic book. So to be a part of its creation was just absolutely a dream come true. Um, I was at Marvel while we worked on books like House of M and Civil War and Secret Invasion, uh, a lot of the miniseries that the movies that have come out recently uh, were based on. And um, it was a lot of fun. I really enjoyed working there. And I learned a lot. I learned a lot about storytelling, about graphic storytelling. Um, but eventually I decided I wanted to go back to graduate school and study children's literature and maybe become a teacher. So I went back to Penn for graduate school, got my MS ed in reading, writing, and literacy, and became a reading specialist. And I am now in my 11th year uh, as a high school reading specialist. And I teach outside of Philadelphia. I teach a reading support class to students who are struggling readers. And I also teach drama and creative writing. And this year I'm teaching a course in horror, mystery, and science fiction as well. Um, I, direct the, <laughs> I direct the school play and I, I have continued my theatrical career after college, both in terms of performing and directing. Um, and I have... Uh, twin four-year-olds who take up a lot of my time as well. Oh, of course they do. So, we have, that's me in a nutshell. <laughs> we have uh, two cats and a dog, and they take up all our time. So 
<laughs> I can't imagine what two four-year-olds are like. Our our grandson. Is, yeah, they're 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 fun. Yeah, our grandson just turned two, so we kind of know. Oh, what that's nice. Like, so, um, Molly Laser is <laughs> with us today. That's L A Z E R or Z as they say down there in America, <laughs> and uh, grew up in Connecticut, home of the Hartford Whalers, Gordy Howe's last pro team in the mm-hmm. NHL. If anybody cares about that kind of stuff, <laughs> but working with Marvel comic. Okay, why are they called still called comic books when uh, graphic novels seem to st- seems to be a, a more appropriate term? Yeah. So the co- when you say comic book, you would be more likely to be referring to like the floppy version, if you will. So the thing that's not hardbound is just a single 22 to 24 page issue, whereas the graphic novel would be a collected version or more specifically, a story that is longer in length, um, as opposed to being like collected single issues in a story arc, but like one big story using graphic storytelling would actually be what a real, you know, graphic novel would be. Gotcha. Now, um, I must admit, I'm not a fan of the new style (laughs) with the big square graphics and two or three different kind of not even panels anymore because I grew up with Mm -hmm. Superman and Batman and and Archie and (laughs) with the linear like uh, comic strips in the newspapers. But when did that, Mm -hmm. do you kind of know when that kind of changed, that style? It's funny because I'm actually reading a lot of the Silver Age comics with my children right now. We've I've I've read over a thousand pages of uh, Stanley and Jack Kirby's Fantastic Four comics to them, um, and it is it's really different. Um, and it's I would argue that it's actually a little more difficult to read modern day comic books with the uh, modern day panel setups than it is to read the Silver Age stuff. Um, I, I don't know exactly when the uh, change took place, but there were definitely innovative artists who kind of changed up that six panel or nine panel grid that had been standard for so long. Um, yeah, I'm not sure exactly when that started. Uh, yeah, I don't know. I, no, I don't know. I don't know either because I kind of, you know, didn't pay any attention after like grade nine. But uh, I <laughs> find the old ones far easier to read. The new ones, I've mm-hmm. got some uh, friend of ours out in Bellingham, Washington has a series he's doing and uh, great stuff, but mm, not my cup of tea, which doesn't mean they're not good. Okay. It's just nothing that appeals to a 72-year-old, if you know what I'm saying. Right. <laughs> Small mm-hmm. laser is with us. So we're talking about her early days just before we get into more substantive stuff. Well, actually, it isn't um, at Marvel Comics. Now, that is like the ideal. It's like DC and Marvel, and, and they're the big guys. It's the big leagues. It's like yep. playing for uh, Montreal Canadiens or New York Yankees. Uh, and you did that within two months, just knocking on the right doors at the right time. Is that what happened? Yeah. So basically, it turns out that my mother's boss at the time used to be a vice president at DC Comics. And so he got me an interview at DC, which didn't work out, which I was like, kind of okay with because DC is DC Comics are not really my cup of tea. (laughs) Um, But he also knew Bill Jemis, who had just left as the um, uh, publisher I think of uh, of Marvel, and he hooked me up with Bill, who for some reason decided I was like the best thing since sliced bread, and actually read an early draft of my novel. Um, and Bill got me my interview um, at Marvel, where because there happened to be an opening in Tom Brevoort's Marvel Heroes office. When I went to Marvel, I interviewed with five people, none of whom were Tom. <laughs> who it actually turned out, and I only found this out much later, that Tom had actually been interviewing people for like two months before I got hired without him actually knowing that I had gotten hired. Uh, so he was actually not thrilled when I showed up in his office and they were like, this is your new assistant editor. Um, but uh, but I learned, I mean, we eventually got, got on famously and uh, I learned so much from him. Um, he's a fabulous editor and a really nice guy. Um, and, uh, yes, it was just really a matter of knowing the right people, uh, who for some reason decided that they liked me. 
Well, <laughs> so, why not? <laughs> um, yeah. Where were you based? Like, where were you living and working at the time? Is that right where you are uh, now? The first or? year. So I worked. So all right. So after college, I moved back in with my parents for a year and lived in Connecticut while commuting out to New York to work in Manhattan at Marvel. And then I actually moved to Manhattan and I lived up in Inwood uh, for three years. So at the tippy tippy top of Manhattan, the last stop on the A train. The A train. Take the A train. <laughs> yep. Wow. And what is an editor or assistant editor? What do you do day to day? How does that work? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so I actually had a whole canned speech about this that I would always give to people. Um, <laughs> so basically, a comic book editor works on the comic book at every single stage from the idea to the printed form. So the editor will work with an author either in coming up with a pitch or if the author has a pitch, they'll bring it to the editor. They'll work on like uh, developing the storyline Um and uh, then critique, oftentimes critique the script once it's written. So then the writer will go back and do revisions sometimes. Uh, then the editor manages the flow of the artwork from the penciler to the inker out to the letterer and the colorist. Uh, the editor will, will do, you know, line editing on the, uh, on the lettering once that's uh, uh once that's done, we'll sometimes give color notes on the color uh, for the colorist to fix. Then once the whole thing is composited and put together with the color, uh, the letter file laid over the color file, we'll just make sure that everything looks right. It's lined up okay. Everything seems to match up and then send it off to the printer. Um, but it's really a lot of just working with people, making sure that the writers and the artists are getting their work done on time, that everyone happy uh it's a lot of uh it's a lot of people management so it sounds like you would have like 19 different balls in the air at the same time and at 217 yes in the afternoon you're doing one thing and at 223 something else pops up and then at 245 something else happens so is that kind of the day is it's very important? true <laughs> it's what yeah and you can imagine like working on i mean our office was putting out god like 20, 25 some books a month. So, you know, all of that work times that number of books. Uh, where does it start? Does it start with the script? It, yeah. So the idea, so there's an idea, a pitch. Sometimes it's an issue by issue pitch. Sometimes it's just a, you know, a general concept that, that then gets uh, just go, go straight to the, uh, the first issue, um, but there's usually some sort of pitch that happens first. I mean, it's a lot like writing prose and having to query a uh, query an agent or a publisher that you got you got that pitch and then uh, and then you uh, you go from there to like expanding it to an outline, then to the first draft, and, and on from there. And I'm thinking the script would kind of look like a movie script. <laughs> Somewhat. So it's funny. I actually work for a company now called Comics Experience at comicsexperience.com where um, you where people can go to learn about uh, graphic storytelling and take can take classes on uh, comic book writing, comic book art, uh, on, on coloring, lettering, editing. Um, and I'm a pro critiquer for that site. So the other part, in addition to the classes, people sign up to be part of the forums there where they can post their scripts and get critiques from other, um, from other people on the forums. And then if you do a certain number of critiques per month, you get a critique on your script from one of the pro critiquers. So people who have worked in the industry. And, uh, so I, critique people's comic book scripts and do comment on like the format and whatnot in addition to the storytelling. Um, so you have to lay it out with, you know, uh, it's, so it's some like, somewhat like a screenplay in that you have the action that comes first. You describe what is going on in the panel and then the dialogue right. uh, is usually written afterwards. But it's, it's a very different method of storytelling that you have to think about <laughs> because I mean, Scott McCloud talks about this in uh, his book, Understanding Comics, how the the about what the the gutter between panels represents, how it could be a gap in time. It could be a whole other event. You have to figure out kind of like what 
goes there and how do you tell that story in single images? Uh, so it's a lot harder than one would think at first glance. Yeah, I think so. To say the least. <laughs> Molly Laser is yeah. with us. We've been chatting about her career with uh, Marvel Comics and of course that leads us into obviously it's it's quite not easy, but uh, that's why uh, the comics, the Marvels, and the DCs lend themselves so easily, I would say, to to um, movie making. It's like the storyboards are already there. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah, so you go, oh, here we yeah. go. That's a Batman story. We'll just expand it and throw mm. in some pithy dialogue and get some superstars. Hey, we're done. Two million dollars a yep. day later for... 25 years <laughs> we're making billions molly laser is here she started out uh, university as we say college uh, connecticut new york city uh, went to the university of pennsylvania now that's different from penn state right that's correct yes and uh, marvel comics talking about comics and now into uh literature as it were owl eyes a fairy tale and also the other one is and i've lost my place on the computer here uh, black rice and lentils lentils and black rice lentils and black rice. so yeah <laughs> why did you uh decide to chuck all the comic book stuff and go back to school and be a teacher i mean there are a lot of factors uh in my decision to leave Marvel, um, this was before all the movies really hit big. So salary was a, uh, a factor in it. I also, um, I, w I really wanted to go back to school. I'm someone who really thrives in a school setting. I mean, I have a second master's degree after my first one um, that I got at Rosemont College. I got my MFA in creative writing and I took oh, like five years to get it. So I, I yeah. love being in school and I missed it. Yeah. So I, like just wanting to be back in a school setting was really the primary factor there. Yeah, I didn't go back to yeah. university, as I say, or college until I was in my 40s. So and I had a great mm -hmm. time. It took me seven years to get my B.A., but uh, it was total, total fun. You know, I didn't think I could do it when I was yeah. 18, but when I was, you know, 25 years later, it was like, oh, this is a, not a piece of cake. But I found it quite not easy, but thrill. I was on, you know, honor roll and stuff like that. And so it was just a, yeah. a total, you do it for the fun. My wife keeps saying, how come you're not making a million dollars a year with that degree? And I go, well, because. Oh my God, so true. radio, what do you if expect? I, <laughs> so. If I had a financial reason to go back and get a third master's degree, I would do it in a heartbeat. Ah, right. Like if I had, yeah. Okay. But. So Molly Laser is with us. <laughs> we got sidetracked a bit. Uh, the book I have in hand is Owl Eyes, A Fairy Tale. And it's Cinderella, but it's not Cinderella. So mm. what got you, because some of your earlier works have been sort of retelling of fairy tales. So what, why is that mm -hmm. kind of um, something that appeals to you? I've always been completely fascinated by fairy tales, like even as a, a small child. Um, and as I got older, particularly when I was in college, I had this love-hate relationship with them, with the idea of, um, you know, perfect people finding perfect romances. It really, really bothered me. Mm -hmm. um, and in particular with Cinderella, Cinderella, it's, you know, if you go back and you read the original Brothers Grimm, the original uh, Charles Perrault versions, um, she has no personality besides being good, virtuous, and beautiful. That's it. So, <laughs> so there were there were a lot of. So it just bothered me. Why does she get the prince? Why does the prince like her? Right. Why does the shoe fit her? <laughs> I mean that didn't make any sense. I mean, I get that that comes from the um, Chinese version of Cinderella where uh, the, uh, the, uh, you know, the practice of foot binding figured into it. So Cinderella actually had the smallest feet. And so they were the only ones that fit the shoe. Um, but the, there's a lot, there's a lot wrong with, with the classic versions of these stories where in in the Peralt version Cinderella's father is not only alive and allowing her to be a servant in his own household but he actively works against her 
over the course of the story. He is just as much of a villain in that piece as the stepmother is. So all these things really started to bother me. And so I was... My goal in writing the book, which I wrote the first draft draft of during my senior year of college, was to try to work out some of these questions that I had about the story and come up with explanations. Why does the prince want her? Why does the shoe fit? Why does she want the prince? What's up with her dad? Mm-hmm. Um And the story actually started as a solo performance piece for a performance art class that I took. Um, For my final in performance art class, we had to perform a 10-minute solo performance piece, and we were given no guidelines. It was just perform a 10-minute solo performance piece. And so I had been, you know, thinking about ideas for this novel, and I ended up... um, creating like the basic plot of the novel uh, and most of the characters for this monologue, which was me as Nora, the main character, uh, after the ball, um, just kind of talking about what had happened as I uh, did a spell to change myself from a princess back into a servant. Uh. And, um, and so I did the performance piece and uh, and then after that, started working on the, the first draft of the novel just as a way of, yeah, working out these issues that I had had with the Cinderella story. Now, I must confess, I just started reading it, but I have to compliment you on the way that you have introduced uh, the um, the suspense and, and I'll say the page turning factor where in the first few pages, uh, Nora in the kitchen but she has this knife and he finds out that that's the only knife or the only thing she has left of her mother and, or memory and uh, then these two uh, bratty kids uh, call her Ella mm. Della and uh, then they say come on let's come on out to this this tree and like you know I'm making this up as I go along because I can't remember mm-hmm. word for word and she says well, I don't want to do that and in, in, internally no that's my special place but then she mm-hmm. goes there and I know that something bad or not is going to happen by the way that you've just laid this out already to me and that's within the first and I've got a bookmark here the first well on page six and so all of a sudden <laughs> it's like within a few pages it's oh my gosh what's going to happen to this this person what why are these people so mean to her how come they're teasing her right off the bat what 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 what's going on here so well done and this like you said oh took thank you, you took you a while to come around to that final draft i suppose hey yeah so huh well i i i, I finished my first rough draft over the course of a year. Um, so I think it was done at the end of my senior year of, uh, of college. It was actually an independent study that I did then. And then I started rewriting and rewriting and rewriting and revising and rewriting um, until I had a version that I thought I was pretty happy with. Like a decade later, I, uh, no, not quite a decade later. So I, if I finished in 2000, um, 2004, then in 2011, I workshopped it at Rosemont College in a novel workshop class where everyone came in with a novel already written. Oh. And um, we all we read one novel a week and we spent three hours discussing the person's novel at the next class. Um, Yikes. So that gave me a lot of really excellent feedback, which I used to then revise further. Um And I used the book also as my MFA thesis, and I had completely rewritten it uh, about a year after the novel workshop. And I came into my uh, my thesis with a fresh draft. I said, this is it. My thesis advisor, who who was Carmen Maria Machado, the National Book Award um, finalist, uh, uh, I was like, she's going to love it. And she's going to say, I don't have to do any work on it. Not remotely the case. So she read it and she said, she said, okay, you need to rewrite this. And I said, no, I just rewrote it. But she was right. Oh, no. Really? Every single, oh, absolutely. Every single criticism she had about it was correct. Um, So I rewrote it again. Um, And the basic skeleton of the story has stayed roughly the same since the very first draft. But... There's been a lot that's changed. I mean, Nora's whole 
personality has undergone a shift. Um, her relationship with her best friend has shifted um, over the course of the novel's evolution. And um, the the last thing to change was an element of the very end of the book, because I, I don't want to spoil it, but there was something about the very end of the book that was never working. It was never quite working for me, and I couldn't really explain why. And for that very last draft that I did, I thought to myself as I was writing it, let's see what happens if one of the characters does the exact opposite thing that he has done in every single other draft. Oh. And so I wrote it the new way, and suddenly it worked. And, it worked. and suddenly everything made sense, and that was it. That was it. So, yeah, an overnight yeah. success in 15 years. So <laughs> <laughs> Exactly. So, being, so, yeah, yes, it took... Yeah. What was it like? I mean, I don't have a very thick skin. So what was it? Must, you must develop an attitude of what the work is what counts, not my ego when you're doing mm. these kind of things. Is that how it works? Like with regards to the writing of it yes, or are you trying to get it published? Or? And, and um, things like I have criticism and the suggestions. and Because you think I've spent years doing this. This is the best I've done. And then somebody comes on and pops your balloon right away. So, Oh, see, I, I've never felt that way, that this uh, is the best I've done. Um, I, I always I, – I read my own stuff and I'm just like, uh, why? <laughs> so, um, yeah, no, I want – I always tell people I want you to trash my stuff. I want I want you to tell me everything that's wrong with it, because that's the only way that I'm going to be able to fix it. Um, so I, I I love getting criticism on my work. That doesn't mean I always agree with it. Mm -hmm. But I mean, it's it, I, I mean, I've had workshops in which teachers have said that if one person says something you disagree with, but everyone else says something different, then you can feel free to disregard that one person. But when everybody in the group is saying the same thing, they might be right. Ah, they might be right. So, <laughs> so yeah. Owl Eyes, A Fairy Tale, and uh, almost running out of time, Molly Laser here. Um, Owl Eyes, A Fairy Tale, it is available from fireandiceya.com and also... Mm -hmm. Tell us about Lentils and Black Rice, which again is a collection of short, shorter stories that you've reworked again. Like one of them says, uh, a young woman sleeps alone, but for her daughter who dreams of using her hair to escape confinement. Aha. Uh -huh. But you've got ah. a different twist on that, right? So, <laughs> Yes. Yeah. So Lentils and Black Rice is a collection of 11 short, shorter fairy tales ranging anywhere from about 125 words to about uh, like 9,000 words in length. Um, so flash fiction all the way up to novelette length. Um, and yes, they are uh, retellings, mashups, um, new versions of fairy tales, Bible stories, and uh, Greek mythology um, written anywhere from, oh boy, I think the earliest one that I wrote, I probably started uh, in about 2006. And the last one that I wrote, I finished um, about mm, a month before the, before the collection came out. Um, and most of these uh, stories have been published elsewhere online or in print journals. Molly Laser is with us. We've been talking about her career in uh, Marvel Comics and uh, the novel uh, Owl Eyes, A Fairy Tale, and also the collection of stories, Lentils in Black Rice. So uh, uh, how do you find time to do all this stuff with your teaching and your twins and your day-to-day uh, -to -day existence and, you know, signing checks and paying the bills and uh, shopping? Uh. And <laughs> Well, to be completely honest with you, these days I don't. Um, I yeah, I don't. Um, I have stories that I want to write, but I I have not had time uh, over the last year or so. I spent about two years working on a second novel. I got thirty one thousand words in, and then decided that this was not the novel I should be writing, so I scrapped it. Um, on that same day, I came up with a new idea, which I have not had time to start working on. So it's a, I, I would love to have time for writing. And right now, particularly with adjusting to teaching high school virtually, because we're our my school district is um, all 
all remote right now. Um, I barely have time for sleeping, oh, let alone. Uh, okay. Yeah. Well. Yeah. Well. Someday, though. Someday I will write again. Yay. <laughs> Molly. <Yeah. laughs> Thank you very much. Quickly tell us your website. Because I know you uh, have My website one. is... <laughs> Yes, it's www.mollylaser.com. And Molly Laser is M O L L Y L A Z E R or L A Z E R. Yep. And uh, go online, find it, check out the books and all the other kind of neat stuff and get an interest or check out her story. And again, um, thank you very much for being with us. And uh, maybe in a year or so, we can chat again if you have a new work in the works. <laughs> Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Thank you for visiting with us today. This is Talking Books and Stuff with Dennis Rimmer. Contact him at dennis at talkingbooks.tk. Thank you, and may all the good news be yours. Oh, and don't forget to check out his book, The Great Canadian Notebook, available across Canada and at amazon.ca. Oh, oh.